Hi, welcome to MEND. I'm Julie. Today on MEND, we have Allison Porto. Hi, Allison. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I am thrilled to have you here. You're the first person on MEND that we have had that is a professional. And it is October 2nd when we're filming this, and we have just started um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and that's why we're having you on today. So can you tell our audience uh, like, about what you do? Um, um, I'm a trauma counselor right now. I am the director of clinical services at Scotty's House, which is a child advocacy center. So we do forensic interviews any ch time a child has been abused or we think they've been a witness to some kind of violence. And then we also provide them counseling for the children and any non-offending family members. Uh, I've also worked for several years with Twin City Domestic Violence Services and I supervise interns, so I've worked with other agencies as well, such as Sexual Assault Resource Center, um, and again, other nonprofits in Bryan College Station. Great. What got you into this field? Um, I kind of changed majors a few times, kind of took me about 10 years to finish my bachelor's because I was making a lot of mistakes and interesting life choices and finally kind of got my life together, figured out what I want, started taking psychology classes and really enjoyed it. And so um, once I found counseling, realized that was right for me. Uh, and then as I kind of got into the field and started working, um, most of the cases just naturally tended to have like a lot of childhood abuse, in particular childhood sexual abuse, even though I was working with adult survivors. Um, and again, over time, I think the type of clients that I saw that I was interested in, um, trauma tended to be the field in particular that I saw the most of and that I really enjoyed working with and it's kind of just expanded to all different types of trauma. Mm -hmm. So you feel like almost everybody that you have seen in a domestic violence sort of way, whether it's children or um, adults, trauma seems to be the common bond and... Not all victims do, some of them grow up in really happy, wonderful homes, um, but, and so, and find themselves in a domestic violence situation and kind of don't know how they got there. Some of them, it is more the typical. They grew up with domestic violence. Even if they swore, I'm never gonna marry someone like my father, they end up marrying someone just like their father. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of once they're in a violent situation, the different types of abuse, the different types of violence going on tends to overlap significantly. So um, if there's domestic violence going on, there's a very high chance that there is child abuse, that there is animal abuse, that there is sexual assaults happening. Um, same thing if you have somebody who is sexually abused as a child, much higher chance that they will then be victimized as a teenager, as an adult. Um, so again, you can have that same person that becomes victimized in different ways throughout their life. Also, there tends to be a lot of similarities. I kind of make the joke sometimes that I think they give abusers a, kind of a guidebook of you need to do this and do this because I will tell victims he's going to act this way and then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And they're like, have you been in my living room? Because it's exactly what he's been doing. Can you tell us what those are for people who don't understand? Um, some of the things like we have what's called the cycle of violence where things can be really good and then tension starts building um, and a victim can feel that coming on that the tension is building and, and will sometimes even antagonize a fight because they know it's, he's going to blow up any minute um, you have the blow up and then he will come back and apologize and bring flowers and everything's wonderful and we're gonna go to church together and everything's gonna be great and so you have the honeymoon phase until it gradually starts going back into that cycle of the tension building and gradual escalation of um, tension and you know verbal abuse until it finally becomes violent again and it just kind of cycles again and again. Um, there's in particular when a victim is looking at leaving a relationship, that's where that is the most dangerous time for a victim and the tactics that an abuser uses to draw them back in, again, is very common. Um, basically, 
they will use every tactic they can think of. So we'll call up a victim and cuss at them. To, They're, you're a horrible person. I can't believe you're doing this to me. Uh, then they might be, you know, begging forgiveness and I'm going to change. Let's go to marriage counseling. And if that doesn't get a response, you're breaking up the family. You're a horrible mother. And if that doesn't work, they'll go to blackmail. I've seen sometimes in text messages where a victim doesn't respond, where literally within five minutes he's gone through 10 different tactics to try and get some kind of response from her, which is why I encourage victims not to have any contact because that person knows them so well, they know how to get to them. They, If they have contact with their abuser, it is very likely they're going to get drawn back in. He's going to say the right thing to make them feel guilty, to scare them, to convince them it's the best thing for the children that they try again, that this time he's really gonna be different. Uh, that's why um, victims leave on an average of seven times before they get out for good. Mm. And because I think from what I'm understanding is that it just becomes one, it becomes a pattern. And and we're all, it can easily fall into patterns, right? Yeah. You know, the way we go to sleep at night or the way we, you know, when we brush our teeth, it, it just becomes a pattern. And at this point, it sounds like maybe too, they're just, their confidence. I can't imagine where they're at in this point in life and to get up and leave that. Yeah. Yeah, because most people don't understand an abuser doesn't start out calling her a bitch on the first date. He starts out incredibly wonderful. He is Prince Charming. He is so attentive and affectionate and I want to know everything about you and you're so incredible and you feel like you're in a Disney movie. You have finally found that perfect person. And then it very gradually and very subtly starts to change and it can be anything from I love you so much, I want to spend all my time with you, so don't hang out with your friends, basically, stay here with me. Um, little comments of, you know, oh, are you going to wear that? You know, just, you know, you're hanging out with that friend again? You know, I don't know that she's really good for you. She, you know, she seems kind of loose. She's always sleeping around. I think if you're hanging out with her, she's going to get you in trouble. So it's very mm -hmm. subtle, it's very small, or if someone goes out with their friends, you know, they may say, oh yeah, absolutely, go have a girl's night, it's not a problem. But when they come home, he's in a bad mood and he doesn't speak to them for days. And, won't, you know, it starts in the argument over stupid things and every time they go out, he never says, I don't want you going out, but he's always in a bad mood. And so it's just easier to make an excuse and not go out. Because in the beginning, when they first go out and this happens, you're still in that illusion of that Prince Charming. Yeah. And so you're waiting for, you're, you're trying to figure out a way for that Prince Charming to come back. Absolutely, that hope that you're going to get that person back, that somewhere in him, this person I fell in love with is still there and I can get that back and we can have this wonderful relationship. That is the hardest thing to let go of. And over time, I've seen the most independent, strong women get so torn down that they will say like, I think I might go to the grocery store. Do you think that's okay? They question everything. They have so little self-confidence. They've been told so many times, you're stupid, you can't make good decisions. Uh, abusers will do what we call gaslighting. So it can be as obvious as they will take a movie out of the, you know, back when movies were still on DVDs, yeah. I had clients talk about he would move them around and then be like, well, where is it? You're always losing these things. He would purposely move things or hide her keys and you're always losing things. You're so forgetful. What so then you... she won't feel competent. Yeah. You know, so again, just little ways of tearing her down. You never can keep anything straight. You're always running late to get the kids to school because again, he's hidden the keys and you know, or starting an argument right before she has a major test, right before she has a job interview. Um, and it sounds like he's doing these things so then it will be and come, become incredibly hard for her to leave because then she thinks, oh, I can't find the keys without him. Yeah. And again, it doesn't start out this way. It's so gradual that many women kind of wake up and like, how did I get here? But again, by that point, they doubt themselves so much. They don't recognize that they're unhappy because then it really is him. Even when they try and explain it to other people, it's hard for other people to understand when it's not overt, when it's not, he balls up a fist and punches me. 
and then if it reaches that point where he's getting physical, they're already so caught up in it. They're so torn down. They're, you know, they really are believing if I could just learn to keep my mouth shut, this wouldn't happen. Is there a time when, because you say so, so many of these um, abusers are so similar, is there, do you see a time frame whenever the physical abuse comes in? Is there, I mean, does it usually take two months or three months? Or does that matter? It, is it different? There's something we call a power and control wheel, and it looks like a pie with different pieces, and there's different types of abuse. So like financial abuse, using the children. Very little of it is actually physical. Most of the abuse is things that work well to keep her in control. And so that might be punching the wall beside her head, but never actually punching her, or cleaning the gun, but not actually holding it to her. Um, so usually they will figure out what works to control her. You know, very often if they have kids, that is a great way of controlling her, manipulating the children, undermining her abilities to parent so that the kids don't listen to her, um, starting arguments in front of the kids so that she can't really say anything because she doesn't want to have this fight and argue in front of the kids, so she just stays quiet. Um, when it does escalate to physical abuse, it's very gradual. It starts with a shove. It starts you know, with something minor and grabbing her too hard. And once they both kind of get used to, yeah, sometimes we get into an argument and he kind of pushes me, then it will escalate to the next level. You know? And so again, it's very gradual. Once they're used to a certain level of abuse, the abuse will escalate. But again, when a woman decides to leave, I always tell them basically, whatever he's done before, you have to plan for it to get worse. If he's never been physical, we have to plan for he's going to get physical. Um, if he's never threatened you with a weapon, but he's hit you, let's plan for he's going to use a weapon. Because again, when an abuser realizes that this person might leave them, that's when it really gets dangerous. Something like 75% of homicides occur within the first three days of a woman leaving an abusive situation. It's heartbreaking. It really is. What, so when these women come to you, if it's for the first time, how, how many of the women can you expect to go back? I mean, I don't know, a lot of a percentage. I, I can't tell you the percentage, but I'm like one out of, say, 10 women come to you. How many do you know will go back the second time? I, the only time I've ever had somebody that didn't go back was when it was kind of a, I was just staying with him because I needed a place. We were barely dating and he hit me. Um, almost every time. Every time? They will go. And sometimes, if it's really extreme, he's in jail, especially where he's kept away from her. The trauma bond that gets built between an abuser and a victim is very strong. And you know that abuser is the only person they have to go to when they have a good day and they want to share good news. When their parent dies and they need somebody to comfort them, he has isolated them so badly, he is the only person in their life. He is the best friend, he's the comforter. And when he gets into an argument and tears her down and makes her feel miserable and then comes back and says, I forgive you and we're gonna be fine and let's take you out to lunch. She feels better and he's the one that's made her feel good. So it's very much like a drug. Mm, this is, you know, it's hard to hear. Yeah. It really is. Some people that I've worked with that, you know, make six-figure incomes, they have a great job, they're a leader in their career, and yet go home to an abusive situation. Sometimes the victim is the one that has the job and brings home the money, so it's not even just, we need him to pay the bills. Uh, again, it comes down to the psychological control or the belief that I have to keep my family together, I have to keep the kids to get, you know, my kids deserve to have an intact family. 
So, yeah, and going to kids, the abuser feels fine with their children seeing this because he feels like he is the Almighty yeah. and that he is, and he has control. Yeah, and over them too, and he doesn't care that they see this violence. Or, you know. Because then it still keeps her in her place? Sometimes they will use the kids. Sometimes the kids are in bed, and so it's easy for a victim to say, oh, well, they're not witnessing it. So when he's just with the kids, he's a great dad, you know. When we get into fights, when he says these things, you know, the kids are already asleep, and it's not until they're out of the situation that they start to recognize how much the kids really did hear, how much the kids saw, how much abuse the children might have experienced when they were just with dad. But it doesn't come out until after a victim has already left. And again, the first thing they do is isolate them from family and friends. Um, and then their family and friends are wrong and not, not, not good people, and then they convince yeah. them that their family is. Your parents don't like me, so, mm -hmm. you know, fine, if you want to go visit them, I'm not going, I'm not comfortable with them, and again, I'm going to be in a bad mood when you come home, so it's easier just not to visit family, or if you're going to talk to your mom on the phone, put it on speaker, you know. Hmm. And it's embarrassing to admit. Yeah. And again, many victims don't recognize that they're in abuse. Uh, there's a great TED talk by Leslie Morgan Steiner where she starts out pulling a gun out of her purse and is like, this is the gun that was held to my head every night, but I would have told you I wasn't an abused woman. I don't, can you explain the psychology behind that? Victims tend to minimize what they're going through. It's a way that they handle it. It's a way that they cope with it. It's also what the abuser has done from the very beginning when he gets into, you know, the first time there's a major blow up and he acts like a complete jerk. It's, I was just stressed out because of work. I was stressed out because of our wedding. Uh, very often you'll see an escalation right before, like right after she finds out she's pregnant, right after they've gotten married, right after they've moved in together. So she's hooked in even more. So he had this blow up, but we just moved in together. I'm not gonna, you know, we just sent out the wedding invitations. I'm not going to. Mm break this breakup now mm. so very often that's where you'll see some of that escalation you said that it's usually the seventh time before they leave mm -hmm. how many women do you know that haven't made it to that seventh time fortunately I haven't dealt with a situation where a client I'm working with has been killed uh, I have certainly seen situations where a woman is in an abusive situation and will probably never leave or she's gotten out of one and not gotten help and jumped right back into another relationship that's abusive or by the time that she comes to me she's been through three abusive like marriages what it why is it the seven that's an average some people it might take three or four sometimes it takes ten times is there anything that you see that finally the light goes off in there, like, I have to get out of here? Is there anything that you see to help anyone out here to understand, you know, like? I think it's different for each one. I'd say every time they leave and go back, I think it's a shorter amount of time before they are get fed up and are ready to leave again. Sometimes, you know, sometimes getting pregnant is, oh, well, you know, we're a family, I have to make this work. But many times I've seen that um, I've had several young college women that we got pregnant, and it's not just me. If it was just me, I'd probably still be with him, but now I have to protect this baby. Uh, so that becomes the factor that makes them leave. Mm -hmm. um, if a child runs in and interrupts and, you know, accidentally gets hit for some parents, that's, you know, that's the ultimate straw. Or, you know, that, you know, even he hit me in front of the kids and the kids saw it. 